started this uh, process back in August uh, of launching these, these projects and having the, a website and developing goals for the, the projects. Um, through September and October, we developed some different design options and came up with a toolbox with different options that could be used and talk about that toolbox a little bit further on tonight. Uh, into November and December, we had two other series of community meetings, which um, I, I recognize some of your names that are with us this evening that you were at those. So th thanks for your continued um, interest and input through these projects. Um, so those earlier meetings were focused kind of on existing conditions, making sure we understood um, what the issues are with 7th Street as well as, well as um, creating goals that um, we're, we're trying to address with this project. And last month we introduced some kind of preliminary concepts for designs. And, and now we've got a little bit further refined designs for 7th Street we're gonna share with you tonight. And we'll also be sharing these with town board um, on the 25th of January um, to get their input and from there, we'll really turn loose our, our engineers to do the kind of detailed design drawings that would allow us to start construction um, in the summer, hopefully. And next slide. So the reason we're looking at 7th Street for a transportation improvements, it was identified as a priority corridor in the transportation master plan, which was a a plan that was just completed last year. It identified 7th Street as a, as a key link needing um, multimodal improvements for um, pedestrian and, and bike improvements. So it, it identified a protected bike lane as uh, the preferred design option. And we'll get into some of those details further on tonight. And then it also identified these uh, pedestrian priority areas, which are the tier one are the kind of highest pedestrian generators, um, businesses, schools, parks, things of, of that nature. Um, so the, those areas are really clustered around downtown and 7th Street and Main Street. So another reason we're looking at 7th Street tonight. And we've done considerable outreach to the community and um, you've likely gotten at least one of these if you're with us tonight. Um, sent out postcards. We did an online survey with uh, over 400 responses, um, number of uh, social media postings and signs in the corridors um, and, and other, other means of getting the word out as we really do want to work uh, to create a project that, that works for the people that live along and travel through these corridors and uh, need a project that has your buy-in and uh, will work for the community. So that's, we do wanna hear from you. Uh, and so in that vein, we, we have done polling throughout these projects. Um, the results here um, reflect that we did have, seemed like we were on the right track at our last meeting that our existing conditions did match your experience for the most part. And next slide. And then it, it also seemed that uh, there was generally um, agreement with, with all of or, or most of the goals that we had written. And next slide. And then as, as far as the top goal, there was one that really stood out, which was the um, goal to create a safe and efficient corridor that's friendly to all modes of travel. So that's reflected um, in a lot of our work you'll see tonight. And then I mentioned the online polling with, uh, looks like this, this, and this question, we had 476 responses and we had, we asked similar questions to, to reach maybe members of the community that didn't join our earlier meetings. Um, and they were uh, similarly positive uh, with around 70, 75% thinking we were on the right track and that our, our basic design looked reasonable. And then we did get uh, 
some comments and feedback for those that that said said no or 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 maybe those responses. Uh, we did have individual comments that were we'll be addressing as well in the project, and then the enhanced design, uh, similar similar kind of response around seventy five percent thinking we were um, had a reasonable design. Mm -hmm. So then we've got these three goals, which uh, we've we've gone over previously. And so number one, create safe and efficient corridor that's friendly for all modes of travel. Number two is make fiscally responsible investments that serve all travelers. And number three, plant more trees and landscaping in the corridor. So I mentioned the toolbox. So that was a uh, an effort to come up with all, all possible kind of design options that could be used in the corridor. And I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but you know, we looked at all kinds of different options and how those could potentially work. And some of those have, have moved forward with, with the project and others have been um, determined that they aren't really feasible or don't really solve the problems we're, we're trying to solve. So uh, if you could go to the next slide. And similarly, those were more the kind of transportation design options toolbox. And this is more of the identity and character for the corridor, uh, things like landscaping, signage, public art. So we also have a, a toolbox uh, of those treatments that can be used as we progress. And so one of the major components you'll hear us talk about tonight are a basic design and an enhanced design. The basic design is something we would hope to implement uh, this coming summer, and it's a more immediate, immediate, lower cost, um, something that we can get get in the ground more quickly to start addressing safety concerns. Um, it's something that can be phased in to the larger enhanced project, which would be built sometime over the next decade. Um, we would hope sooner than later. It's really going to depend on on funding sources, and the. Um, those funding sources, so the basic design is already budgeted within the town's uh, 2021 budget. And as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be pursuing um, different grants and, and different opportunities for funding the, the larger enhanced design. The maintenance is something that can be, for the basic design, can be maintained with our existing staff and equipment, while the enhanced design might require new, new staff and, and new maintenance practices. Both of these uh, require ongoing education, enforcement, and evaluation. And so that's really a, a comparison of, of the two. And as you see images tonight, it'll be probably more clear where the basic is more, more about striping on the road and uh, different kind of more temporary uh, improvements while the enhanced is more more permanent in nature. So next slide. Carlos is going to take that one over. Great. So Paul, that was the the beginning of your deck. We're just going to do quick two quick polling questions here for everybody, um, and I'm going to launch these. <clears throat> so thanks everybody for coming tonight. My name is Carlos Hernandez, uh, transportation planner uh, uh, on the project team, and you'll hear from me tonight when we uh, we get to the polling parts of the conversation. What what I'm going to do is um, I put up the poll. Hopefully you can see this, and this is a way for us to interact with you tonight. And so know that um, we, we take these results very seriously, and we want to hear from you. Uh, so we have two questions tonight uh, for you to be able to respond. Those of some of you already are, which is great. We're also using tonight the uh, chat function or the Q&A function. So if you have a question as the presentation is going on, please put it in the Q&A or the chat. And then when we get to the end of the presentation piece, we're going to go back and we're going to respond and talk through all those questions and uh, hopefully get you responses. If we can't get it tonight, 
we've made commitments at the other meetings to follow up on those and we intend to do that tonight as well. So um, the last part I wanted to just mention is that a lot of the things that Paul showed you are on the um, project page. And so if you're interested about the existing conditions, we have a great video that we had for e-meeting number one that summarizes all that and the conversation that was had with the community. We have this toolbox with all these fun things that are possible in 7th Street. And then the last meeting that we had in December, that's also available to watch as well. So if you're feeling like, hey, I'm just showing up and, and what's the context for all those things, please know that all lives there. And, um, and so you're kind of like watching Star Wars and you're watching the, the third one before the first one. And so that's kind of a fun way to do it. Uh, and so just know that's what's going on. So polling questions here coming in. First one was what best describes your interest in the 7th Street project? So let us know kind of geographically where you are, what's going on. And then the second one is if you've been part of another meeting or not, and that'll really help us so that we don't know if, uh, how many of you have been here in the past and Alicia maybe can fill in some of the blanks. Uh, as she's going through the design. So I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to display it. And then this will be our first set of polling. And then we'll show you some um, results here. And then also at the end, we're going to ask you some more questions. So um, can someone out in the, the audience let us know through the chat or Q&A if you're seeing the results? Uh, looks like um, of the, I think there's about, uh, let's see, 12, 15 of you here. So a lot of you just live in the area you live along 7th. And this is great. So um, about nine of you have been here before and five of you the first time. So Alicia, most of most of the people have been here before, but maybe some background would be helpful as you go through um, when you find opportunities. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Alicia and I'll be back um, after she's done to ask you some more polling questions. So thanks for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. All right, let's see, as long as everybody's seeing something that says 7th Street Basic. Um, I'm Alicia Zimmerman, I'm with Fox Tuttle Transportation Group, um, and I'm an engineer, transportation engineer. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the, um, kind of the design concepts that we're looking at right now. Um, and this is a reminder, um, I guess your second tonight, that we're talking about 7th Street tonight. So if you have questions on Walnut, please, uh, stick around tonight and then join us again tomorrow night. Um, but if not, this is what we're going over for now. So first, a little bit of background. I'm not going to get into it in depth, as Carlos mentioned. But for those of you who haven't been in a meeting before, um, we certainly started on 7th with looking at the existing conditions. Um, and that just means looking at how the roadway is configured currently and you know everything up to crashes and uh, input we've had throughout the corridor on how it's existing, it's operating in its existing condition. Um, you can see from the cross sections over on the right that we have generally one lane each direction with turn lanes. Um, on the north end up here by the one labeled ash north of Maine, there are pieces with two lanes southbound and a little bit with one lane uh, northbound as well. And those wide outside lanes, um, turn lanes. And then on the south end, uh, there's parking in the majority of the corridor and turn lanes in the middle um, for some of it. Sidewalks along the majority of it, they're pretty narrow, um, but that's generally what's out there today, currently. Just a little reminder, I'm sure all of you drive this regularly, but um, in case you don't have that picture in your head, this is a picture taken looking north from, you know, just close to the gas station looking north at Main Street on 7th. You'll recognize those flexible posts um, that make it so you can't turn left into the gas station. 7th Street approaching Walnut, also looking north and you see that pedestrian crossing. Um, this one is not signalized, but uh, pedestrians cross here. And then north of Stone, Stone Mountain. Um, this is that area with the parking sometimes utilized, sometimes not on the outside. And uh, this is right next to the multifamily, um, which does have a little bit higher utilization there for the parking. Um, and then a center turn lane that turns into a turn lane at the intersection. So just three spots, but just to get you get your brain wrapped around to what it looks like out there again. So, so when we looked into this basic design, this is what I'm going to talk through first. One of the things we wanted to do was just figure out how to quickly, really quickly, maybe in the next two years or next year, um, implement 
some good updates and um, some improvements with the budget that we currently have. And we kind of lumped those into three different areas um, of these kind of quicker fixes, including you know, the pedestrian safety piece, the looking at crashes and how can we fix those uh, more quickly. And then also keeping in mind those, some of these look familiar from previously in the presentation. It's because these all kind of relate back to those goals that Paul talked about up front. Um, a safe space for people to ride bikes being the last piece. On the ped safety and comfort piece, one of the first things we looked at was where pedestrians are crossing, um, where we've gotten an input that pedestrians are crossing and trying to make that a little bit more comfortable and safe for those pedestrians. And what we show here are what we call refuge islands. Um, they are either where temporary or permanent materials and in this basic condition, they would be with temporary materials. You can see that in the, the bottom image is what those temporary materials might look like. There are many different variations. Um, but one of the things these do, these do um, beyond making the pedestrian crossing the road more safe and more comfortable are um, that it, it actually reduces the speeds on the road. It gives visual cues. It gives a little bit of a chicane or a jogging effect um, to those cars, particularly coming in at the south end um, here at Garden and Stone Mountain. But hey, this is a place where the, you're, you're not just in your car anymore. You're, there are other people um, using the road too. Um, so it should give better compliance with the 25 mile per hour or you know, down to 25 mile per hour speed. And like I said, would be built within the 24 month trial materials. And the locations we have, these are, are Garden, Stone Mountain and Locust. And the Garden and Stone Mountain ones obviously are catered towards people who are already using those locations, particularly Garden, but especially you know, students and children who are crossing in some of those locations. And Locust is a really centrally located um, cross street, which is one of the reasons we were looking at that. Also on the ped safety and comfort front, we wanted to make sure we didn't ignore some of the things that are both currently ongoing and maybe emphasizing them even more in the next year um, with some of these improvements are the current 2021 sidewalk maintenance pro program. And that goes through and replaces some of those concrete flags, the squares on the sidewalk when they need to be replaced and are cracked. Um, or sometimes it also, you know, will, will level them out by uh, grinding down the, the lips when you, you know, see a little trip hazard as well as ongoing ADA compliance, which just means those curb ramps that are going down to crosswalks, you can see one a little bit later here. Um, if they aren't in compliance with the law, um, you know, when we start doing improvements um, and when they come across them in the maintenance program, they'll, they'll be updating those as well. But also considering things like tree trimming, you can see here, you probably barely even see it, a pedestrian sign for the pedestrian crossing. It's pretty hard to see um, because of things like tree, tree and hedge trimming. So trying to make sure that we're considering this from a budget perspective, but an overall perspective as well. As far as intersection safety improvements, um, one of the highest crash locations on this whole corridor is 7th and Walnut. Um, and particularly if you look at the crash rate, which means like per the number of cars and people who are walking and people who are biking coming through here, um, it's, it's a pretty high injury location. And so looking at ways to reduce that crash potential, potentially slow speeds, but primarily just reduce the number of potential conflict points. Um, people turning a little bit unclear, you know, who, who's going at what time here given the, the interaction with the Main Street intersection. Um, so one of the ways we were able to do that was by reducing the number of turning movements at the intersection. Um, and increasing visibility for those, uh, those more vulnerable road users by providing this uh, refuge island. It also reduces that crossing distance, so you can do it in two phases. Um, so this refuge island it allows a pedestrian crossing from the corner to stop in the middle and then look at the other direction before they continue their path. It also includes um, improvements on the, the walnut legs of the intersection that are called curb extensions or bump outs and um, that reduce the crossing distance and help kind of visually give cues to control those speeds and give a little bit of calming effect as well. Um, in the basic option, this design would be implemented with 24 month trial materials and those would look similar to the slide that I showed before. Um, but on the right, you can see a, a little bit longer term one that has been in for a little while and is operating pretty well. 
Uh, the next intersection safety improvement one we're looking at is 7th and Main. Um, you all know and love this intersection or don't love it. Um, and we wanted to figure out how to, again, reduce that crash potential, clarify this intersection, and just figure out how to make it safer for everybody who's going through it. Um, so one of the things we looked at was doing curb extensions um, or bump outs with those temporary materials. Again, two good example photos in the slide there. Um, and that does shorten pedestrian crossing distance, but it also just narrows the look of the intersection without taking away, you know, vehicle turning radius capability or um, capacity for cars going through this intersection. Um, again, like I said, this one in the basic condition would be with those temporary materials, um, some good examples of uh, what those could look like on the right. Making sure we don't ignore the safer space for people on a bike being one of the main goals here. Um, we're looking at potentially putting in buffered bike lanes along effectively the whole corridor. And you see with the plan view on the left um, that the kind of AutoCAD drawn up plan view is at Oak Street, but it really applies to most locations. You can see that we still included parking on in a lot of the locations, and that would mean there's parking outside of the buffered bike lane, just like the photo shows. Um, what does the buffer do? It just adds physical horizontal separation between a traveling car and somebody traveling on a bicycle. Um, it also gives a little bit more cue for the bicycles of where to ride in comparison to a parked car, so that somebody opening a door of a parked car um, wouldn't necessarily, you know, the bike wouldn't be right up against them. Um, and really, like, like the slide says here, it just gives visual cues to everybody of where their space is um, within, this, within this roadway. This would be 24-month trial materials, which just means that the, the actual paint materials we would put down here would require restriping, you know, within a few years and probably looking at uh, when some of those maybe enhanced projects come in, um, looking at restriping this with any minor tweaks that are necessary. This is the north end, um, all the way up by Windsor Lake, and it's effectively the same, same idea, buffered bike lane, um, but it doesn't have parking, just it doesn't currently have parking, and so those bike lanes would be um, out at the edge of the roadway, kind of like the photo down here. So that means that there are buff buffered bike lanes all the way from um, Eastman Park Drive all the way up to the lake connecting to these um, trail connections. And I should note that at the south end of the project, and I keep saying Eastman Park Drive, but um, there are ways that connects to a multi-use trail to connect all the way down to um, the more regional trails down in that area as well. So as we move into the enhanced um, designs that we've put together here, um, we've kind of developed five key projects. And the idea behind these were, was enhancing the corridor rather than just fixing what we can in the short term. So these are really enhanced, bigger idea projects with geometrical and or geometric, I should say, and functional components. Um, but just as critical to those geometric and function that the, you know, the engineers pull up um, are making them comfortable and vibrant, um, kind of an amenity within the city, particularly since this can be a really big gateway for you all. Um, and so to talk about, these are the five different uh, kind of components we're going to talk through, but the first one, I'll, I'll pass it off to Roger here to talk through. Well, good evening. Uh, thanks, thanks, Alicia. Uh, my name is Roger Sherman, and I'm with BHA Design, and I am a landscape architect, and our, our role in the job is to, uh, to kind of help with uh, the aesthetic side of things and uh, beautification of, uh, of the corridors. And, and, uh, and so this is a, an aerial image that some of you have seen in previous meetings, but for those of you who haven't, this is a kind of looking north on 7th. Uh, and so gardens in the foreground here in the Stone Mountains and kind of the middle ground, and then some of the multifamily housing just beyond that on both sides of 7th. And uh, so there's a real, one of the things I'm really excited about with this concept is the ability it, it provides to narrow the street and really allows us to reclaim what's already a nice wide right of way, uh, reclaim some additional space that was was pre 
is exists as roadway and uh, and turn that into a linear park that could be, really create a wonderful amenity for the whole town connecting you know, all the way from Eastman Park up to uh, to Chestnut and then the multi-path would even go beyond that and connect all, all the way down to uh, up to Main Street and down to the Poudre River. So it's uh, really a, a, a terrific opportunity uh, that really isn't found in many corridors in the town. So this is really unique in that way. Uh, the, uh, I guess one of the things that's important too is I think having success here uh, requires I think one of the measures measures of success is that people will use the corridor more frequently and then and you know both in terms of transportation and just and enjoyment and so we try to create a pleasant experience and pleasant place to be that's inviting that will encourage people to get out of their cars and uh, uh, use the corridor is one of our uh, one of the things that we could see as a, a benchmark for measuring that success. Uh, and uh, you know the the landscape that's shown here is all of this is very very conceptual. You know we would have to work with city staff to figure out what makes most sense uh, in terms of the intensity of landscape, the type of landscape, the water use, the maintenance kinds of things. So please know that this is just a very early kind of concept, and as we move forward, those kinds of things will be worked out. Uh, but you know ultimately this this street, just like every other street, contributes to the town's character, and it. Uh, can really have a positive impact on people's perception of uh, of the town. And then this is a an eye level uh, view of at Garden. So we're standing kind of on Seventh, looking looking north at Garden. And so the the roundabout here is uh, uh, this is a concept that we're, seems to be the the most uh, a uh, feasible concept for solving the problems that we're trying to solve. And uh, on top of that, from a transportation standpoint, it really provides some really wonderful opportunities, like I said, to uh, to enhance the corridor. And some of those opportunities might even include things like pr providing a gateway to the surrounding neighborhoods. And, uh, and that, you know, that it doesn't have, it could be something very simple. It's just kind of framing the entrance to garden with something like lights or trees or, uh, uh, could even be some wayfinding signage leading to the schools or other parks and things in the area. Uh, and and uh, again, as I mentioned, it, it then also provides a lot of great connect connectivity through the roundabouts that encourages people to use this in a safe way uh, to get to other surrounding areas. And, uh, and just really, I think creating, it doesn't have to be big, big expressions here. It can be some small touches, like on the west side of 7th, even the addition of a, some small upright trees periodically along that fence line and some small amount of planting can really take that what is kind of a barren side of the street and turn it into something pretty pretty wonderful. Uh, and so it, again, it doesn't have to be these very expensive, costly things, but just even some small touches can make a big difference. And uh, I'm Steve Tuttle with the Fox Tunnel Transportation Group. I'll go ahead and touch on some of the, the traffic benefits um, with the roundabouts. And in particular, um, why we came up with this alternative here, we did look at, at always stops um, at Stone Mountain and Garden and looked at traffic signal warrants uh, and what a traffic signal, how it would operate in terms of delays and cues. And the roundabout is really uh, a solution to deal with that Z movement um, from Stone Mountain and Garden um, that, that Z pattern that you're probably very familiar with. And, uh, and currently there's issues with the, the queues that stack northbound approaching uh, Stone Mountain and southbound approaching Garden. And those queues kind of compete in that, in that limited space between the intersections. And a roundabout would solve this by, um, by eliminating the need for, for, for having left turn storage. Essentially, if you're northbound heading into Stone Mountain, uh, you have very little opposing vehicles to enter that roundabout and make a left turn. So it becomes a lot easier. And similarly on the south side at Garden, southbound heading into the roundabout, you have very little traffic conflicting with you. So you're able to enter and make that left turn. And so you eliminate the need and the issues associated with the queuing. And you do that without, uh, you know, with, with providing adequate level of service uh, and, de and delays for all the movements versus some, uh, some of the de level of service and delays that we saw with the always stop signs and traffic signals be pretty excessive. 
And then roundabouts also are, are very well known in, in for proving to, um, to reduce the amount of vehicular conflicts at an intersection, particularly those involving uh, right angle crashes and broadside crashes that are typically the more severe crashes. And so roundabouts eliminate a lot of those conflict points so that when crashes do occur, they're occurring at a much slower speed and they're often at a, at a, uh, on a, a glancing angle or a side swipe and much less severe. And then they also have the benefit of, of reducing speeds on the approaches and exits, typically have to navigate to around 15 miles an hour on the inside of a roundabout. So it slows traffic um, and combined with, um, with several of these along the corridor, it's gonna um, have that effect of sort of keeping the, the speeds calm um, and, and not, not having people trying to, to speed up uh, back up to 55 miles an hour between the, uh, between the intersections. And then also once they're built, they um, require a lot less maintenance once they're built than a, um, than a typical traffic signal, for instance. So next slide. And then uh, before Roger gets back into to talking about um, some of the really cool urban design elements at, at 7th and Main, I just wanted to point out building on what Alicia had talked about in terms of the curb extensions and the benefits of those to uh, pedestrians and, and cleaning up the geometry of the 7th and Main intersection by um, redefining the lanes, uh, providing the buffered bike lanes and uh, eliminating some of the some of the wasted space that's out there and some of the short additional lanes. Um, we have been working with CDOT and had a couple of meetings with them. And so, um, and we're also taking a look uh, to make sure that trucks can be accommodated um, for the movements that they're required um, and the types of trucks that, that we know travel through this intersection. I just, so I just wanted to point that out uh, before I hand it back to Roger. So another one of the opportunities that we were asked to explore is the creation of a gateway uh, at the intersection of 7th and Main. And this, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, uh, the, the curb extensions, uh, even, they add space to those pedestrian areas on the side of the street. And, and really every little, every square inch or square foot in these kinds of downtown urban spaces can really uh, add a lot of opportunity for, for uh, creating visual interest and space for people on the sides of the streets. So even though these are not big, big areas that we're talking about, they're big compared to what exists there today. So as we, we bump out those corners, it really does uh, make a, a big difference. Uh, it, it makes uh, space for things like uh, uh, gateway elements that we've already talked about, uh, people spaces on those corners that are a little bit less uh, there's more space to get away from the traffic while you're waiting to cross. Uh, there are opportunities for small amounts of green, spa green space, street trees, color, just all kinds of things that could really add uh, interest and maybe change the perception that, uh, and kind of convey the fact that you're, you're entering a, a vibrant downtown area. And that's kind of what the, the underlying goal here is of this, this idea of a gateway here. Uh, and so maybe we, we can just shift here to the next next uh, image. So, so as I mentioned with the, the roundabout bird's eye image on 7th, these are very early concepts and uh, there's a lot of uh, back and forth that we'll need to, to uh, conversations we'll need to have with town and CDOT and uh, others involved to make sure that what we're doing makes sense and neighboring businesses, property owners, all of those kinds of things. But uh, so these these sketches really are early early ideas just to generate conversation and uh, reactions, uh, but they do start to convey some of the the ideas that the DDA has has developed, and, and they've created a set of uh, pretty interesting design guide guidelines for some of their signage. And so we thought, well, let's let's kind of try and represent what that could look like at this intersection. Uh, that it it's, it sounds like the the big intersection to, for the gateway is at sixth. So this would be an introduction of some of those kind of theme elements where we'd extend downtown a little bit uh, west of that that intersection. Uh, so it could be things like those those vertical elements, hanging flower baskets, flower pots, special pavement at the corners, uh, possibly even enhanced crosswalks and other plantings and things like that. But yeah. It, there's a good chance that the flowers won't be pink and purple uh, in the fi in the the final go around here, but uh, you never know. So uh, anyway, just fun to explore some ideas early on and see what's possible. Thanks, Roger and Steve. Um, and I'm realizing when I'm listening, kind of as a participant too, we use some jargon too. So when we talk about geometry, um, one of 
an example here of geometry is kind of what lanes there are going which direction and you know how they are configured in um, in relation to each other so you can keep that in mind as we keep moving on here um this seven street multi-use path roger alluded to in the um, roundabout discussion and it's basically the idea that we want to keep a multi-use path you know ten, not just a sidewalk but wider than that and particularly offset from the roadway where we can um coming all the way from the river from um, Eastman Park Drive all the way up as far as we can. We've drawn it through Maine so far, you know, could, could even look at potentially further than that. But the idea there is just to make that connection and make it an amenity. Um, through, the, through the wider area, it's a little bit easier to visualize and we've already seen the sketches of it, but I've shown here one example of what it might look like through kind of the more narrow areas. Um, we've already talked in some of these public meetings to folks who live right along this stretch, and it would be a tight squeeze. Um, we, so far, it looks like um, we can potentially get it in uh, with maybe a curb move in some locations, maybe not, a, uh, wouldn't require the curb to move in some locations. Um, and that all depends on some of the additional surveying and right away that we would need to be looking at. But this, this image really shows kind of what it might look like in those locations where it's tighter still be a nice amenity for those who, you know, like myself, I have little kids, I don't always run it when I'm riding on the road or if I'm walking with a stroller um, to be able to make that connection all the way up. Um, as you can see, the arrow is pointing to what we call a multi-use path. On the intersection safety standpoint, um, kind of some of the key projects that we're looking at are, again, this Locust Street uh, location for one of those um, pedestrian refuge islands. The reason we're only showing Locust in the enhanced version is because in um, the enhanced version, there are effectively already, um, you know, refuge islands because of the roundabouts. They're called splitter islands, those little triangles coming into the roundabout, you're, you're able to cross one direction, one lane, stop, you know, look the other direction and cross. So those are actually taken care of, which is one of the reasons we want to do those in temporary materials to start with. But this locust one, you know, if there need any tweaks or anything like that, those are made and then it's installed with um, transition to some of those more um, hardscape materials uh, into concrete raised, kind of like the photo on the right. And again, this has all the benefits of providing visual cues and slowing traffic and kind of providing that calming as well. And then the last intersection safety project we're talking about in the enhanced version is taking this seventh and walnut um, that we've talked a little bit about the configuration before and moving it into that hardscape or putting concrete in to make it a little bit or more much more permanent um, after we've done any tweaks that are necessary and, and, and seen um, the improvements that's made. And I didn't talk last time about exactly which movements are allowed and how that's changed. And so I'm gonna talk for just a second about that now before we finish it up. Um, but you'll see that east-west on Walnut, you can currently go across. Um, you would stop at the stop sign and go straight across. And we don't see a ton of, um, we don't see significant volumes that are doing that right now, um, given the traffic counts that we've taken, but there are a few. And so those folks would have to utilize different parts of the grid in order to do that. Um, the other movement that would be a little bit different is if you're on Walnut Street and you're trying to turn left onto 7th Street. Um, and that's, that's shown as uh, not being allowed with this configuration in order to provide that pedestrian and bicycle refuge area to make that crossing a little bit better and to reduce the conflict points. Um, left turn off of 7th Street would still be allowed um, and then right turns onto, onto 7th Street are still allowed in both directions. So um, the idea here is to keep what we had in the, uh, in the basic condition and just enhance it to, into a more permanent design with some more significant signage and things like that as well. So um, with that, that covers the majority, that covers the big picture pieces of the enhanced design and I will pass it back to Carlos. So Alicia, can you just leave it there for a second? Yep. Can you, just for the record, and so for the Q&A folks and those who watch this later, can you take the pen, a red one, and can you draw the two movements that are not going to be allowed to happen anymore when the island is there? So you well, can't get red, but you can't <laughs> okay. go straight. 
You can't go straight through. So if you're on Walnut going east or west, you can't go straight through that one. And then what are the what's the other one? Okay. So then if you're Walnut and you want to go south, that no more. And then if you're Walnut and you want to go north, that one. Right. And so those movements were the lowest volume movements based on the counts. And so we were trying to figure out how to get a refuge in the middle and make it safer, but still accommodate the big movements. And so the design that you have here took the lowest movements out, but still keeps the highest movements. And in, in a green pen, the one of the high movements, right, is if you're going north on 7th and you want to make a left-hand turn to go west on Walnut. That's still allowed, correct? Yep. And then if you're going south on 7th Street and you want to go to like Town Hall, so you want to go east on Walnut, that's still allowed, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this for all those, there was good questions in the Q&A in the chat about that. And I think it's really important to get that one on. So can you erase those? And then Steve, I'm going to ask you to go back up to 7th and Walnut. So Alicia, can you go to, um, let's go to Roger's drawing for 7th and Walnut. And Steve, yes. are you here? Roger's drawing for 7th and Main. Yeah, 7th and Main. Yeah, Steve, are you there? Mm -hmm. We may have lost Steve. Oh, we may have lost Steve. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, there was questions. Let's. So I'm going to hold that one for a minute. There was questions about a double left-hand turn here. That was a really good question, and I want to make sure um, that we get Steve back on to answer that. If you're if um, if you're looking now, there's some information he provided in the chat. If you can see that, and so we'll ask him. He's back now. Hey, Steve, are you back? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, you're here, man. Hey, so thanks for coming back. There was questions in the chat and you did a great job of answering those. Can you can you talk through the double left and can you use the like the Carlos normal planner speak and not the engineer speak? Yep. Well, I gotta get real technical. We gotta talk about green arrows and green balls. <laughs> but so the way that they, you know, if they're familiar with it today, um, it's just a typical you know, you can turn left, a permit, what's called a permissive left on a green ball. Uh, you know, you yield to traffic coming at you and then you can turn left at any point during the green portion of the northbound southbound phase on seventh. You can turn left to go west on main. What we've talked to CDOT about is if we go to a dual left turn, side by side left turn, that creates a sight distance issue for the outside left turn that can't see across the, oppo the, the opposing left turn on the other side of the intersection. So CDOT would require that those left turns would only, the north and southbound left turns would only be able to be made on a green arrow. So you can imagine that if 7th Street gets 30 seconds uh, of green time normally, and at any point during that 30 seconds today, you can turn left as, as long as there's not an opposing through vehicle, conflicting through vehicle coming at you. Um, when we go to a green arrow, you might only get six or eight seconds. Uh, to be able to make that left turn. And then the rest of the phase while southbound is going, you can't turn left. And so that actually results, and we see this happen sometimes, it actually results in worse level service for the northbound left turns and the southbound left turns that would have to go to what's called protected only or just on the arrow left turn. And so we had talked to CDOT about, you know, whether they would permit it or whether they would require it to operate that way. And they essentially said that, well, the busiest times of the day, we'd require it to operate that way. Well, that's when we need it. At nine o'clock at night, you can imagine it'd be pretty annoying to be out there waiting for a full minute to turn left because you have to wait only for the arrow. So hopefully that's, uh, that, that makes some sense. Um, and we were hoping that, um, that we might, uh, might be able to find a way to make it work, but the sight lines and, and the safety considerations associated with it um, are, are really what, what kind of kills that idea for us. And then, um, Alicia, I'm going to go back down to, Alicia and Steve, can you go back down to Walnut and 7th? And we're going to get to the other roundabouts in a minute, so don't worry those who ask questions about it. Thank you. Uh, so Steve and Alicia, there was a question about, couldn't you consider a roundabout at this location? And so I know that you looked at that. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, it's just that that is so close. I don't know how many hundred of feet. I want to say it's four, you know, 400 feet or so from 7th and Main. And so you can imagine that, you know, we know that there's a lot of northbound vehicles and that the queue for the left turn we talked about can back up the Walnut sometimes. If it's a really bad day and it backs up into a roundabout, 
essentially then any vehicles can't circulate into the roundabout. So now southbound vehicles on 7th can't get into that roundabout and now they back into Maine. And now the cars can't, the northbound cars can't go anywhere, the southbound cars can't go anywhere. And so essentially roundabouts can create gridlock when they're near signals. And so we try not to locate them. Um, typically, you know, I try to stay anywhere from, uh, you know, 1200 feet or greater away from a signalized intersection. And so this, this intersection is really just too close. And then wasn't there something about trucks as well and like the, the, the width that you have there in order to get a roundabout to work there and the size wasn't going to be so great either? Was that an issue? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it, because this isn't a truck route. So it's it's a little tighter than Stone Mountain and Garden. So we certainly don't have the room to work with there where those are T intersections and we've got a whole sort of leg that doesn't exist that we're able to widen into. And so that would be pretty difficult um, to accommodate, any, you know, accommodate, say, a 40 foot bus in a, in a in a tight roundabout like this without having to take some right away or, or completely rebuild on the corners. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and remember also, Carlos, that the um, down at Stone Mountain and Garden, you have the linear park area. There's an extra width in addition to what's shown here. So not only would it would it have to be would it maybe not accommodate the same, but it would actually have to be tighter. And this down there is you know on the um, constrained end to start with. So up here it would be incredibly constrained. Okay, so then let's go down to the roundabout, and then I'm gonna we'll go through the queue of questions here. So can you go to the Steve slide for the roundabouts? So Steve, can you once again um, go through the operations? Like there's questions about like, well, wait a minute, there's like three roundabouts in less than a half mile here, man. Isn't this going to get locked up? So talk about that traffic piece again. And then there's, I think there's some concern about school buses and fire trucks making their way around these. And can you talk about how you design them to accommodate that? And you're on mute, Steve. Steve, you're on mute. Putting multiple roundabouts in a corridor is actually very common. Um, you know, you certainly can think of if you've been to Avon, um, places like that where you're continuously moving. You're really, um, you're not having to stop. And so, you know, it has the effect of you're not going to get going too fast along a corridor. And, and on a corridor like this for speed, you know, people, we, we want to mitigate speeds. And we, you know, the purpose of this project is to improve bike and pedestrian safety. Um, it, they do a really good job of that. Um, so you're slowing a lot, but you're not stopping as much as if you had a traffic signal or stop sign. Um, as far as trucks, so these, these are considered, this size that would fit here is the smallest, just at the smallest um, of what we would call an urban compact modern roundabout. However, as you can see in the picture here, this, this center island here, and this is similar in size, these would be slightly bigger um, this center island is, is mountable. And so a fire truck doesn't have to go all the way around it. A fire truck can simply turn in front and over it. And so, so that's where a fire truck coming in here, if it needs to make this turn, it, it can drive over all of this. And so it's, it's color is different and it's, it's stamped and it's, it would not be comfortable for a normal car <laughs> to go over to high speed. We certainly want to avoid that. Um, but a truck would be able to make that movement by most of the amount of all. Now, that being said, if, if this gets advanced and we go to final design, the size of this is real close to 90 feet in diameter, which gets us into modern roundabout designs where we may be able to have some raised portion in the center. Um, the benefit of having at least some raised portion is, is there's some landscape potential or, or at least some streetscape. You're not going to put anything in there that's going to um, cause a site obstruction, but then you can also get some some signage in the middle um, to help define the movements of the roundabout. Steve, can you talk about like two things? One, like school bus, because school bus can make the turn, right? It doesn't have to go into oncoming lanes. And then Alicia, can you talk about the two options for bicyclists? So Steve first and Alicia. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish on the, uh, on the, so essentially a school bus would be, it would be able to make these movements at this roundabout, um, either one of these with, you know, only its rear wheel would go up onto this mountable surface, the truck apron, as we call it. Um, so it'd be able to make that movement. Um, it'd be designed certainly for the fire truck and the and the bus bumper, which typically about 40 feet. And then a trash truck or a 30 foot truck would be able to make these movements without encroaching any of the mountable surfaces. So I saw there was a question about the um, bicycle movements through here. And I'm going to use the, the northern roundabout here as an example, but it applies to both of them. 
Um, so if you're riding a bicycle and you're in the bike lane, this is a, we, we kept those um, buffered bike lanes in between the two. If you're in the bike lane, you have two options. You can either come out and become a vehicle and use the roundabout um, you know, in a typical way. I do both of these when I'm on my bike. Um, and the other option, let's see if I can do another color. Um, coming in that buffered bike lane. There's also kind of a slip lane or a little bit of a ramp up to the multi-use path here. And the ramp is designed so that it's comfortable for a bicycle without having to you slow down too much or get off, but you want, them to, you want those on bicycles to get slow enough that when they merge onto that multi-use path, they don't, you know, run over someone with a stroller and they become more of a pedestrian type feel. So that applies to all of the legs, um, particularly the ones coming in on 7th. Um, you know, if you're on a bike on another leg, you can either hop up on the multi-use path or, or use the roadway as well. Great, thank you. And then Roger, there was a question in the chat about land. Can you go back to maybe Roger's roundabout design? So. Yeah, that's a good one. So Roger, there was questions about like um, some of the shrubbery and trees and things grow into the road and block things from happening. And it, I, I know that you went to particular lengths here to kind of minimize that. Can you speak to that balance, please? Yeah, I'm, uh, thanks for asking the question. Uh, in fact, I meant to, to, to talk about that when I was talking about this slide, but the, the last, during the last meeting, we, we had some concerns expressed about uh, our last sketch showed planting in these areas where the lights are on the corners of the roundabout. And so we've removed all of that uh, shrub planting and just kind of shown low grass ground cover type material on those, those corners to increase visibility and safety. Uh, we have pulled trees uh, away from the corners for the same reasons. Uh, you know, it's kind of a balance, right? So some things like lighting and things like that help uh, you know, darker hours, it's, it's really important to be able to see pedestrians and people crossing the intersection. So some of those kinds of things will still be needed. Uh, their exact placement can be, you know, can vary. Uh, we also, uh, someone had concerns about uh, the lighting shown in our last sketches as well. And I'll just talk about that for a second too. The last sketches had more of an exposed light source uh, in the sketch and we've adapted this sketch to show downward facing lights so that uh, that light trespass into adjacent yards is is minimized or eliminated uh, from these lights and uh, so you know these again are just conceptual type of designs for the for all of these features but uh, we're, we're trying to illustrate something that's that's reacting to your uh, your comments at Seventh and Main. We haven't adjusted that other sketch yet, but we the the perspective sketch. But the plan view, we pulled all of those pots uh, away from the intersection and, and those things uh, to try and react to that uh, that comment as well. So we we heard you loud and clear, and we'll uh, those those comments will find their way into the next level of design too. Alicia, can you go back um, two slide, one slide, I think, from here to Roger's perspective of the linear park? And Roger, is there, there's a transit stop between Stone Mountain and Garden today. There are questions that came in about that. We can find a way to accommodate that transit stop in this section with this design, right? Yeah, well, well obviously, we'll have to work with the transit provider to, to, to talk about their preferred locations for those. And uh, whether it's a, a pull off or an in lane stop, we'll have to work through all those kinds of details. But yes, I think, I think uh, Steve and Alicia, you, you may have some thoughts about that as well. But I think there's ample space physically to do it. Now it's just kind of figuring out where the transit provider thinks the best spot for it is. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay, so we can um, do some more Q&A, but what we wanted to do first is walk you through a couple of frequently asked questions, and then we're gonna ask you some two polling questions. So if you have five more minutes to give us, that, that will be the bulk of the meeting. And then if you have other questions and you wanna stick around, we can do that for probably another 10 minutes. So um, I'm gonna start with just some frequently asked questions. We have 10 of these and we'll just, I'm just gonna kind of enter them into the record and, and hopefully they help. Uh, the first one we frequently got is why you're doing this project. And so we're doing this project um, because we're trying to reduce crashes in this quarter. It's in one of the top crash quarters in, in the city. And we also are not only trying to reduce crashes, but make it more comfortable for people walking and biking. And that's a direct outcome of the transportation master plan. So if you, uh, you want to know more, you can read that in the TMP. But that was a, a clear objective. 
uh, that was stated and supported by town board. So that's why we're doing this. Second question we get quite often is, hey, like you're making all these changes and uh, okay, fine with the recommendations, but like, is it gonna make it any better? Like, what, what are you gonna really do to make it better? And so um, the first thing that we've been talking about is how the corridor today has some really wide spaces. Like if Alicia would put up those corridor pictures where there's a lot of asphalt out there and the lanes are kind of not, they're inconsistent. And so when Steve and Alicia keep saying the geometry, what they're talking about is getting the lanes striping in the right places so that it's less of a demolition derby out there. And so that people are driving in the same right spaces, predictable spaces. There's a place for people to bike in the proper spaces in the right spaces and just some more awareness for everybody out there. And so that's like really what, how it can be better. And then clearly like all these things that Roger's been talking about with the landscape and design and lighting are trying to make it a better presence for the quarter. Third question we get quite a bit is like, why are you doing a basic and an enhanced? Isn't that just a waste of money? Like, like aren't you just gonna do the basic and then you'll never do the enhanced or like, why waste the money on basic? Just do the big ones, right? And those are really valid and good questions. And so the reason why we're doing basic is it's gonna take some time to save up or get the grants to build these bigger projects. And there's no reason why we should leave what's out there the way it is because of the safety issues. So the basic designs are a way to start the journey and try to mitigate crashes, make it more predictable while we're waiting for the, the bigger projects. And these basic projects, I know that some of them initially might not be the, the most aesthetically pleasing things, but they, they really have been proven to reduce crashes and get people feeling more comfortable out there. And they allow them to be transitioned. So we're not wasting anything. We're not building anything that we're gonna have to tear out by this kind of phased approach. Fourth question, and it came up a lot tonight, and I think it's really a great question. Like, aren't these changes gonna make traffic worse? Aren't you gonna make queuing worse or travel times worse? And um, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news on this, but um, if you look at the TMP and you look at the forecasts in the roadway uh, plan, you'll see that the North Front Range is growing. And in Windsor is, but all as is the North Front Range. And there's a lot of new commercial and industrial and housing all over this area. And so this corridor, the Seventh Street corridor, recognizes that the network traffic volumes are growing, regardless of this project. It's a result of the changes that are going on in our region, and that we can't build enough travel lanes in this area to accommodate all that's coming. We just can't. We don't have the physical space. We'd be buying hundreds of pieces of property to add a lane in each direction. So the, the roadway plan and the transportation master plan said this quarter, where we can't afford and grow and expand, we need to make it safe. We need to make sure that no one else continues to keep on this trend that we're doing, which is the growing the number of crashes by, you know, 10, five or so every year. We need to get a handle on that. So why can't it be widened? Well, that's the fifth question we get quite common in this conversation is, but there's not the space. Like a lot of the other quarters um, in, in Windsor, there's the opportunity because they're new quarters, there's not houses right next to them. They could be expanded. But the, this quarter from Eastman Park, just north of Maine, there's not the uniform area to expand for four lanes. Like you may get a block or two where you could expand to four lanes, but but you'd be merging right back in to one lane in each direction. And so it's just not possible to do that because we don't have the right of way to do that. Um, like the, the other question comes up and they got three more of these and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, why are you adding spaces for places for people to walk and bike? Like, why aren't you focusing on moving more cars? Isn't, isn't that the priority? And our answer to that is we're trying to balance everything. We're not trying to add more space for one group. We're trying to take the constrained spaces that we have and make it more safe and predictable for people who are moving in those. And you have to kind of recall that this the 7th Street corridor is a major north-south corridor that connects Windsor schools. It connects like the two regional trail systems. It connects the parks. It gets people to downtown. Like this is one of the corridors that connects through and it, it's not just for cars. Like you see people walking on the sidewalks and they're riding on sidewalks. And so there, this is the reason why we're not just trying to stripe it for more cars because we really can't, like you just heard. It, it's because we're trying to find the balance for everybody. Uh, we get a lot of questions about trucks and like, can't you just build a truck route or what about trucks? And like, and so the story here is that trucks that are 45 feet or longer are currently restricted on 7th Street. And so that restriction is already in place. Um, when we went back and looked at the counts and we looked at trucks that are a little bit shorter than 45 feet, there's um, around 30, 
four or so a day. Um, and so these are not like Amazon delivery trucks, right? Those are like sprinter vans. I'm talking about like single unit trucks that kind of deliver maybe mail or beer. Uh, and so, um, so there, there are 34 of those a day. And during this study, we determined that, that there, the designs can work with what those vehicles are. And we're not trying to encourage more, nor are we trying to reduce the ones that are there. And know that this study, the 7-3 study has nothing to do with a truck route or a bypass or any of that. That's a whole other study. This study specifically is about multimodal corridor in 7th Street. And then uh, the two final ones that we talked a lot about tonight, like why you're recommending these roundabouts, like at Stone Mountain Garden, like what's up with that, right? And Steve went through it and I, and I think it's probably just worth mentioning again that like we did look at a lot of options there, like stop signs, traffic signals, and, and those actually um, pre pre present more problems than solutions in terms of traffic and crashes. The roundabouts actually help solve a lot of the challenges because of that close, I call it a Z movement. Some people call it an S movement. They're really close intersections. And so they're ideal candidates for roundabouts and, and reducing crashes. And then the final one that we get a lot is like, how much is this all gonna cost and when are you gonna get it done, right? Well, like we've said a couple of times, the town of Windsor has a budget for improvements on 7th Street for this year. And the, what you saw for the basic designs, we can build that with the current budget that's allocated for this year. And then there's a budget um, for uh, long-term, or for the maintenance for that as well. And then we are already starting to apply for some grants for the longer term projects. So we're not gonna wait. We're already kind of starting to try to move forward with ideas. Like if you're gonna build something in hand, start to get the money together because it could take a couple of years to do that. And so that's that's the you know reason. So that's the strategy behind the funding. So those are the the top questions that we get. Hopefully that answers any more outstanding questions you may have. Um, we're going to do some polling questions too, and then those who want to leave, thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Those who want to stick around, we can answer some more of the questions that come in the chat for a little bit. So um, Alicia, I think you can actually do this. Do you see that thing that says um, and a launch poll? You might be able to do it. If not, I can reclaim. Cool. So we have two questions we'd like to answer, have you weigh in on tonight. And we'll use this information when we go back to town board. So the first one is, what do you think of these basic designs for 7th Street? Does it look reasonable? It looks good. Uh, second one is, mm, it looks okay, but maybe you need to make some small changes. And then you'll let us know in the chat what those small changes are. Third one is you'd like to see some other design and you can let us know what that design is. Or the fourth answer is like, I'm not sure. I, I don't know yet. And, or, or maybe you don't wanna weigh in and that's fine. The second question is about the enhanced design for second or seventh street. So the first um, response is looks reasonable. Um, and the second one is make small changes. The third one is choose another design. And the fourth one is not sure. So Alicia, can you launch that poll? If you hit launch, it'll be able to allow the participants to start weighing in. So it's the same we're getting, response. We're getting responses. Okay, cool. All right, right now. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so those are, the, those are the questions that we're gonna ask you. And then we'll give you another 10 or 15 seconds here. And then Alicia, can you close it and mm -hmm. display it? Close it in two or three. All right. Um, all right. Can you all see? Yeah. Okay. So some looks reasonable is trending. Some small changes coming up. So let us know uh, the small changes. Thank you. Let us know what those may be. Right. Um, Paul, in the interest of letting people go who want to go now. Uh, can you just do a quick summary of kind of the next steps? And then Alicia and Steve, let's get back into the chat questions for a little bit. Yeah, so we will be presenting uh, a similar presentation to town board at a work session January 25th. And with their, with their blessing, we would move into uh, more detailed engineering. So if you're interested, um, tune in on the 25th. Um, also suggest you continue to follow the project, uh, Windsor Project, WindsorProjectConnect.com is the website um, for, for other updates. Um, and again, we are meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. to discuss the Walnut Corridor and, and what, what we've got planned there. So 
I think that's um, what we've got. And then we can get into more Q&A or if you're, if you got something else to do, feel free to um, go ahead and call the night and we appreciate your input. Great. Okay, so Alicia and see there are a couple that came in 7.59 at eight o'clock. Can you just kind of go through those and respond to those as you see them? Yeah, there was one um, that was a follow-up question on bikes through the roundabouts, I believe, from Lee. Um, and it says, bicyclists heading northbound on 7th when approaching Garden. Sidewalks will be multi-use, but we'll have to get back off the bike. So I'm going to do kind of the same, same type of process as I did um, on the other one. It's cut off here, but there are um, proposed uh, buffered bike lanes all the way down to the south. So you could come up in the buffered bike lane and we've shown the, the path on the outside of the roundabout wide enough that you could, as somebody on a bicycle, come up the ramp in the same manner and use this crosswalk to cross and then use the multi-use path all the way, you know, the rest of the corridor if you want. Or you could use the ramp back down to get back on the road. And then the other option for those who are more, you know, on the road riders, you're in that bike lane and then you hop off and go around the roundabout. Hope that answers the question. And then one other one, somebody tell me if there's, um, one other one was about, let me see if I can get back to it here. Oh, sorry, close your eyes everyone. Um, was about the locust um, pedestrian refuge here and about left turns. And the idea here is northbound, you can still legally make a left turn. Um, you would be making that left turn out of the through lane, just like there are a few other intersections throughout the corridor that currently have that um, configuration. The, the goal is to get this crosswalk, you know, as protected as possible with the median while keeping the nose far enough back that it makes that left turn possible. Southbound, obviously, the left turn lane is still there. Great. Alicia, can you go to the seventh and walnut one? <clears throat> seventh and yep. Yeah. So Steve, I'm gonna ask you a question, then Alicia, I'm gonna ask you a question based on what Lee asked. So Steve, can you pull or you have access to the volumes of vehicles that uh, traffic counts at this location? And can you give us kind of a perspective of how many vehicles are gonna have to take a different pathway? And then I'm going to ask you to kind of forecast a little bit like those, I don't know, I think they're in the tens or twenties, but those vehicles, like what other routes they have access to now that they're not going to be able to make their, their lefts out. Yeah. Hold up just so I don't miss, miss speak. <clears throat> but the, uh, so we did get peak hour counts in the, in the, the morning and afternoon, uh, evening periods, uh, as well as pedestrian and bike counts back in February 2019. So this was during non, you know, during COVID, uh, pre-COVID conditions. And so the heavy movements, I'm gonna draw, um, you know, certainly in the, it's in the morning. Um, in the morning, there's a lot of folks doing this northbound to go west. They're trying to avoid, you know, a lot of them are, are avoiding Maine and the backups there. You can even see, you know, observe, people coming up here and they're kind of looking and then they go real quick because they see that they're not going to be <laughs> not going to make the light or they're, they're going to be stuck in the queue. Um, so that's a pretty heavy movement as, as well as um, this. And we're talking about, you know, 80 to 90 in the peak hour for that. This one's actually over 100 in the morning and about 60 in the PM. So there's a lot of, so those, those will be maintained. Those were the heavy ones that we wanted that we said, okay, let's keep those, um, those movements with the, um, with this improvement. Um, however, the, you know, this left turn is five and eight <laughs> cars. So less than 10 cars an hour in the highest peak hour. Um, there's about 10 to 25 that head eastbound and uh, similar volumes on the other side, about five to 15, uh, making the left turn to go south and going through um, about 15 to 30. So we're talking about 40, 40 to 45 vehicles um, for instance, that are doing this or doing this today, um, that if they were to come here, they would make a right turn. The nice part is, as you look at this, and this is a great grid. 
there's so many different routes, so many other different routes that by the time you take 45 vehicles and you divide it up, it's not like everybody's going to go to one spot. Um, you know, there's lots of places to turn. Um, there's other ways to get to get south from the east side of Walnut. Um, you know, I know we talked at the last meeting, I, I think there were some folks that kind of lived in here and they said, well, you know, our route is to go this way um, because they know that this signal up here is really short. <laughs> so we've, we've actually spent some time looking at this signal and it's an all pedestrian phase because the school, there's not a lot of time to make this left. So that backs up. And they said, well, you know, we're going to end up driving through the McDonald's parking lot. And so we're sensitive to that. Um, but in the general context of overall volumes, the amount of traffic that would be rerouted is pretty low. Um, you know, meanwhile, just to give context, north and south on 7th during the peak hour, there's over a thousand vehicles an hour. So while it's an inconvenience for some, it's not a, not a huge volume. We've seen these done in other places, and typically we would not expect that any one other location is going to feel the brunt of any relocated traffic. Okay, great. Thanks. That was awesome. Alicia, there was a question uh, about bikes getting through east-west on that wall. Are bikes allowed to go east-west through there? Yes, 100%. Um, I only showed one of the legs here, but on Walnut, if you come tomorrow night, um, spoiler alert, we have some buffered bike lanes shown. And this actually shows um, that bicycles get priority here. And those, um, this is called a trap lane in traffic engineer speak, where you're coming along and it puts you into a right turn lane. And so then the bicycle, somebody on a bicycle would be here and they wouldn't have that turning conflict anymore coming across them. They stop here and they go across and there's a, basically a bicycle storage area here. Um, alternatively, if you're more comfortable with it, you can, you know, become a pedestrian either here or like this and cross as we'll do a different color here. Um, a pedestrian coming up here would cross in two, two stages as well um, in either direction. Nice. So the same configuration exists going um, eastbound as well. Cool. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for asking good questions. They're going to be helpful for people who come back and watch this later on as well. So thanks for doing that. Is there anybody else in the last minute or two here that we have that is anything else that they, they want clarification on? Okay, I'll let you think for another minute. Paul, can you just uh, replay the, uh, the next meeting and next steps for everybody just for the record? Yeah, so this is hopefully our last uh, community meeting on, on 7th Street. We'll be meeting on Walnut Street tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And we'll be presenting both to town board on January 25th. So tune in if you're interested there. And then follow along on the project, uh, project connect, windsorprojectconnect.com as well. Great. Okay. Well, first, obviously, thanks to everybody who stuck around. Everybody was here tonight. Really appreciate your time and effort. And Paul, anything else? I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your, your input and time tonight. Cool. Good night, everybody.